We're in the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Over that. Matthew 22, 1 through 14, the King James text today reads, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a supper for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to seek the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Amen. I want to talk to us today, as I've said, on the topic, dressing for the occasion. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, let's go to the Lord one more time in prayer. Father, once again, God, we come to you, Lord. We thank you for the word of the Lord. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Ghost that we feel in the house of the Lord today. I'm certain that those who are watching by reason of the internet, in spite of my heavy breathing and my heart singing, I believe, Lord, that they too could sense and feel the presence of a living God in this service. The time has come when the Word of God must go forth. This is the most important part of any church service and Lord let us never forget let us never forget that this is the most important part of the service for the word of God is our life it's our breath it's our sustenance today master help the preacher of the gospel to deliver the word that you've placed in my spirit let the people of God, those who would watch by reason of the internet, let all who would hear now and later receive that which I'm about to offer. Help them, Lord, to understand that I am under the anointing, I'm under the hand of the Holy Ghost, and therefore I am not merely delivering the thoughts of men or my own thoughts. But rather, O oh God, I'm allowing myself to be used of God to speak to their heart and to bring them comfort and instruction and help as they walk with you through this life. 
We ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. Dressing for the occasion. You'll notice overhead in the illustration for my message today that there is a, a number of people who are gathered together. You can see that at the center of this number of people gathered, there appears to be a bride dressed in her uh, gown and a groom with his uh, suit and his near and what have you and you notice that all the people gathered around them while they may not be wearing tuxedos and they may not be wearing um, gowns as the bride is every one of them is dressed nicely amen they look nice they have made some kind of effort if I'm going to go to my friend's wedding if I'm going to go to my family member's wedding. I want to look nice. It's a way of showing respect. It is a way of acknowledging that this is a special occasion and you want to uh, treat your family member. You want to treat your friend. You want to treat them well. So you at least put forth the effort to look nice. Have you ever been to a wedding and there were family members or there were friends who came to that wedding and they just looked like they crawled out of a ditch somewhere. And man, I'm telling you, anybody with even the littlest bit of decency in them, anybody with even the littlest bit of you know, uh, uh, of compassion in their heart, you're going to look at that person and think to yourself, what in the world is wrong with them? Now listen, you don't have to come to the wedding in a tuxedo. You don't, you know, if you don't have those kind of clothes, that's fine. But you can surely wear the best you got. Am I telling the truth? Right. See, I'm going to tell you, God don't expect you to live up to some standard way up here somewhere. Although there are some churches that will try to tell you that. God doesn't expect everybody to live up to this certain standard. But rather he says, give me the best you've got. Hallelujah. I don't expect you to do more than you can do. I don't expect you to be more than you can be. I don't expect you to look better than you're able to look. Oh, but for heaven's sakes, put forth the effort to look the best you can. Mm -hmm. My Lord, have mercy. Am I telling the truth today? Yeah. Amen. Tommy and I have gone on cruises. We like cruises. had not been able to be on one for a good while now. Uh, partly, of course, because now he's without work, but before that, we had COVID come along. We love cruises. That's, that's one of the most relaxing vacations you'll ever take. I love to be on a boat, just be gliding through the water at about 20 miles an hour. It's moving so slow through that water, and you feel the slowness of the movement. You actually feel like you're just kind of slowly moving along, and it makes your heart rate kind of drop a little makes your blood pressure come down a little it calms you doesn't it booby it soothes you you know and there are so many neat things to do on a cruise ship you know and boy we we, we like cruises well at least one or two nights depending on the length of the cruise one or two nights during the course of the cruise they're going to have a formal dinner at the dinner hour See, every night, unlike the rest of the, the time, you might eat at one of the little restaurants they have on board, or you might eat at the buffet, which is part of the cost of the cruise. You can eat all day and all night if you want to. And they got food out all the time, you know. And uh, you can eat at the buffet and all this. And they have all these little specialty places, little pizza-style place, little sandwich place, different things. So there's food available. But in the evenings, you're assigned to a dining room. And you're assigned a dining hour. So there's a specific time each evening that you go to a specific dining room. And you sit at the same table with the same people throughout the course of the cruise. And it's all assigned by them. You don't have any part in the assignment of seats and what have you. 
and you get to meet some neat people. We we every single cruise we've been on, we've enjoyed meeting the people that sat with us at the tables. And by the end of the cruise, you're practically in tears because you feel like you're leaving old friends. But once or twice, depending on the length of the cruise, at the dinner hour, they require you to dress up. Now, they don't have a standard that says you can only come to dinner this night if you're wearing a tuxedo, or you can only come to dinner if you're wearing this or that. But they say, but this is the formal night. You know, dress as nice as you can, right? Now, Tommy and I will always try to bring a nice suit jacket and a tie and, you know, or a suit, you know, so we look real nice when we go to those formal dinners. And some people will come to that dinner and they'll not have the formal clothes that we have, but they've got a nice dress shirt. They've got a nice pair of dress pants, you know, and that may be all they have. God knows, I don't know what their income situation is. I don't know, see, if somebody didn't gift them the cruise, you know. They may not even have paid for their own cruise. Somebody may have given that to them as a gift. And they may not have the resources. They may not have been aware of how it works to, to bring a suit, you know. So they do the best they can under the circumstances. But everybody that night comes to dinner and they make the effort and they look nice and it makes the entire experience of dinner more special than it normally is, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how the way we dress and the way people dress around us affects the way we think. It's no wonder so many workplaces have dress codes. It's no wonder so many work environments say, you know, we like dress casual or we like shirt and tie. You know, we like our men to wear jackets and our ladies to wear this and that. Uh, because the way we dress is indicative or representative of our attitude toward that place or toward those people or toward that event. Am I telling the truth today? Mm -hmm. In our primary text today, the king throws a wedding for his son and he sends his servants out. And I preached recently on this exact topic, but it, it was from a different passage with a slightly different uh, story, a, a slightly different parable. But he went out to invite guests, and once again, this parable tells us, like the other, that the guests he initially invites are too busy. They're too preoccupied. They've got other things on their mind. They can't be bothered with going to this wedding. And after a while, the king finds out that, oh, the crowd you would think would be there, the crowd you would expect to be there, isn't going to be there. So there's lots and lots of room. There's all kinds of space. There are many chairs empty. The king says, well, that's all right. If the people you would expect to be there, you know, the A-listers, the, the hot shots in your community, the rich and famous and powerful, the politicians and the millionaires, if they don't want to come, then that's all right. Just go into the highways. Go into the streets and find everybody and anybody that's willing to come. I'm here to tell you today, friend, don't you believe for one minute that that church down the road is full of people who are going to make the rapture, who are going to stand before God, who are going to participate in the marriage supper of the Lamb because there's a good possibility that after the rapture, that church will still be having services. It'll still be packed to the rim. There still will be plenty of people to pay that preacher's salary because those that would be invited are too busy with things of this world mm -hmm. to be interested in stopping. The Bible said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I like a lot of things this world has to offer, but I got news for you. There ain't a one of them I like enough that I don't want to get up out of here when Jesus comes. Amen. 
I love my booby. But you know what? When Jesus comes, that relationship, that relationship's over because in heaven, the word of God said after the resurrection, they're neither married nor given in marriage. There's no longer going to be marital connections in glory. It's not necessary because as a spiritual person, you are going to realize your full potential. You're going to realize everything that you are as a spiritual being. And as a spiritual being, you don't need physical intimacy. You don't need physical relationships like that. The Word of God also said that we shall be known even as also we were known. So that means that probably... When I see Tommy, he'll know who I am. When I, he sees me, he'll I'll, you know he'll know who I am. I'll know who he is. We're going to recognize each other. We're going to know that we had a special relationship. You know what I'm saying. Doesn't mean we're going to go dumb. It doesn't mean our minds are going to go blank. And all of a sudden, we're not going to have any concept of family or friends or spouse or what have you. But our priorities change. And everything changes when we finally put off this mortality and put on immortality and I got news for you as crazy as I am about Tommy I'm not crazy enough about him that I would want to miss the rapture so that we could stay together for another few years till I die no no thank you I'll take the first train out of here amen but you know there are so many Christians today Booby who have become so caught up in this world. They're so caught up in what they can get out of this world. They go to church because they want to hear the preacher tell them how they can get the most out of this life. The messages that are preached on television and on radio today and on the internet by so many preachers has more to do with quote unquote living your best life. then it has anything to do about living the best you can for Jesus. Well, I got news for you. You turned, you tuned into the wrong guy today. I'm not here to tell you how to live your best life. I'm here to tell you how God would desire we live for Him. Now, I'm going to tell you a little secret. You live for Him like you're supposed to live for Him, and He will heap upon you blessing. He will heap upon you favor. He will do things for you like you've never had done. The Word of God said, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. So the Lord will bless you. He said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But you're not going to live your best life and experience the best that God has to give unless you put God first. And yeah, I still preach that. Believe it or not, there's a few of us preachers around that are still preaching that old-fashioned message. Few would attend a wedding without at least making some effort to dress accordingly. We may not own a tuxedo, but surely we put on the best garments that we had. The appreciation and gratitude that we might feel for the invitation would be reflected in the way we dress. Our wardrobe choices say a great deal about our attitude toward the task or the event at hand. When we go to work, depending upon the type of job we have, we dress accordingly. Some places, workplaces even have a dress code. So it is with Christian living. We live a good life, a godly life, not so much out of obligation, as out of appreciation and gratitude. See, a lot of preachers get up and they preach, Thou shalt, thou shalt do this, thou shalt do that, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. You do this, you go to heaven. You do this, you go to hell. And everything's black and white. And man, I need mean to tell you, saints are falling into the pit of hell ten times a day and praying their way out. And then they're in heaven for a few minutes during church. And then they leave the building and by God, their feet are right back in hell before Monday morning even comes. Because that's the message that they hear preached. The grace of God is worthless according to these preachers. The grace of God does nothing for you. Your salvation is contingent upon your ability. 
take to live a perfect and sinless life. And my God, if you even slip, you better repent before the rapture. Because if you haven't repented before the Lord comes, you're going to miss out. Well, i got news for you. That's not the message of the Bible. <sighs> did, you, did you listen to the primary text I read you today? Did you listen to the part where after those who had first been offered an invitation to come didn't come, they were sent out to gather others, and then they come and told the king there's still room. And the king said, well, go out and get some more people. And the Word of God tells us, listen, because here's something most churches aren't going to tell you. The Word of God said they went out and they gathered even more folks. But here's the language that King James employs. Both good and bad. Oh, my goodness. You mean to tell me that the wedding, the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to have guests that are both good and bad? Yep. Sure, it's not evil, not wicked, but bad. You see, there are some Christians who are good Christians. There are some Christians who are bad Christians. There are some people who know how to live this thing the way the Bible teaches to live it. And there are some that, bless God, can't live it for nothing. They just don't even hardly make the effort. But somehow, some way, by the grace of God, they're still going to make heaven by the skin of their teeth. And it will be by the grace of God. They may not have put on a tuxedo, but bless God, they made some kind of effort. They may not be the most perfect Christian. I got news for you today. I may not be the best Christian in the world. I highly doubt I am. And I don't claim to be. But I'll tell you what, I, I sure put a lot of effort into it. At least when it comes to my faith and my conviction, I, you ain't going to shake that out of me. I don't care what you do. Amen. Oh, I want to tell you, both the good and the the bad, those who are able to maintain a certain standard of conduct and a certain standard of living, and those who aren't able, who aren't as apt to be able to do that. Oh my Lord, you didn't really think about that, did you? Many of you have heard this passage your whole life, and you really never thought about what it says concerning both the good and the bad, have you? Amen. I want to tell you today, the king then walks into the room and he looks around and he sees folks there from all walks of life, poor people, you know, unhealthy people, people who never would have been invited to an occasion like this. But you know, most of the folks are so grateful for the invitation that they put on the best they got. Then he casts his eye over this way and he sees a guy sitting there just sprawled out on a chair wearing his old dirty jeans like he'd just come out of the field, like he just finished working. Didn't even take a little bit to go home and clean up and, and find a clean outfit to put on. Find some matching garments to put on. Put something on that at least has the appearance of dressiness. Not casual, not funky. Oh, he wasn't too happy with that individual, was he? He wasn't too pleased. He said, what on earth is wrong with you? You come to a wedding and you hadn't even made the slightest effort to dress for the occasion. I'm here to tell you today, folks, there are a lot of Christians today who have been taught by preachers that God is cool. You can come to church and dress like a bum. If you want to go to the beach after church, then wear your shorts. Wear your tank tops to church. It don't matter. God is cool. It doesn't matter how you look coming to church. Folks, I'm going to fill you in on a little secret. I'm going to fill you in on a little secret. Everything we do in this life is a dress rehearsal for eternity. Did you hear me? There are reasons why God compares so many spiritual principles with natural things. Because it's in the process of our working on these natural things that we're working out spiritual principles. 
For instance, the Word of God said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So as a man is striving to love his spouse and take care of his spouse as Christ loved the church, what is he doing? He is constantly thinking about what? How much the Lord loves the church. Do you follow what I'm saying? So there are things that God compares to natural things because it helps us to bring spiritual principles into focus. It helps us to understand spiritual things better. When the Word of God talks about dressing for a wedding and going to the wedding and not being dressed appropriately, let me tell you a little secret. Going to church is a dress rehearsal for that wedding. If you're going to come to church and not give a fig about the way you look and not give a care in the world about showing God or the house of God or the presence of God or the Word of God any respect, do you really think that your attitude is going to be any different in eternity? Hello now. Do you really think that your attitude all of a sudden is going to change at the rapture and all of a sudden you're going to be, oh yes, but I'm dressed for this occasion. Do you hear what I'm telling you? No, because your whole life you've spent your whole life not caring about where you're going, not caring about showing God any particular respect or showing God any particular reverence. I got news for you. I don't care what church I go to. I still wear a shirt and tie. I still wear a jacket when I preach. There's a lot of preachers I see and I'm going to tell you, I, I don't want to be them on Judgment Day. I really, and you can call me hard, you can call me nasty, you can call me every name you want to call me. I happen to know I'm telling the truth. I don't want to be those men on Judgment Day. And God stand there and say, you know what? It isn't about me demanding that you do certain things, but when you come into the house of God as my representative, when you stand in the sacred desk as my representative, when you preach my word to the people of God, and you don't even put forth the effort to look nice. I'm not standing up here saying that every preacher has to wear a shirt and tie and all that. No. I know for a fact that in certain cultures around the world, in certain parts of the world, like for instance in the Philippines, um, they don't wear ties a whole lot over there at all. Because it's hot. <laughs> it's an island nation. It's hot. It's humid. But they do have a certain style of shirt that they wear that is considered dress attire. When you see a man in the Philippines wearing this certain style shirt, it's dressy compared to, you know, average everyday t-shirts and what have you. And when you see preachers over there preaching, they're wearing those dress shirts. Do you follow what I'm saying? I'm not saying that there's this certain standard that you have to aspire to. I wear a shirt and tie. I wear a jacket because... I love my God. I love my Lord. I am honored to have been called by Him and anointed of the Holy Ghost to preach this great gospel. And when I get up to represent Him, you better good and well know I'm going to do the best I can to look the best I can to put my best fall forward. Am I telling the truth today? But we have an entire culture in the church world today that is telling the people of God it is not necessary to make any special effort. It is not necessary to do anything special or to consider the house of God uh, more important and more precious a place than you would consider the sandbox or you would consider a nightclub. People dress better to go to nightclubs. 
No, you can dress the, the house of God. You can come to the house of God the same way you dress if you was going to a bar room. You can come to the house of God the same way you dress if you were going to the rodeo. You can come to the house of God the same way you dress if you were going to the park or if you were going uh, to, to, to go to the beach after church. You know, God don't care. It don't matter. Wrong. Wrong. God does care. He does see that one who's not dressed for the occasion. He does see that one who's not showing any respect. Hello now. He does see that one who's not made any effort at all to show his appreciation for the invitation. Oh my goodness. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? Oh, I look at every time I go to church, it's a dress rehearsal for the marriage supper. I'm on dress like I'm going to see Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm coming to this place. I believe God's real. I believe hell's hot and heaven's real. I believe this Holy Ghost is a real thing. I believe God sees me. I believe God knows me. When I come to the house of God, you better good and well believe that I dress in a fashion that reflects those convictions. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Say, Pastor, are you preaching about how we dress coming to church? No, no, no. I'm using that as an example today, my friend, of our attitudes and our thought processes. I want to tell you, when we go to work, depending on the type of job we have, you know, we're going to dress accordingly. So it is today with Christian living. You know, we strive to live good. We strive to live a godly life, a moral life. But we're not doing so out of obligation, but rather out of appreciation and gratitude. Our holy God has forgiven us our sins and received us into His family. How foolish would it then be for us to continue to live as godless unbelievers and sinners. In Romans chapter 6, 1 through 6, the word of the Lord declares, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. The grace of God compensates for our weaknesses and our faults. The Lord is happy to overlook that which we cannot do. But He fully expects us to do what we are in fact capable of doing. Can I tell the truth? Mm -hmm. Some folks see no value in attending the house of God or praying or tithing or spending time in fellowship with the people of God. But these are actions which are indicative of one's faith. Unbelievers don't do these things. My goodness. But for the believer, these are the things which demonstrate our love for the Lord and our devotion to His Word. Failure to do that which demonstrates our faith is tantamount to attending a wedding in a t-shirt and shorts. If I tell the truth, we must dress for the occasion. Most of us today would not dream of going to a wedding in the same garments we wear out in the yard to work on our gardens. Many today go to church dressed like they're going to a picnic. 
Their wardrobe choices demonstrate that they do not consider the house of God or the presence of God a very special thing. I'm still old-fashioned enough to believe that the way in which I dress when entering into the presence of the Lord and receiving from His Word is important. It demonstrates to the world my attitude about God and my reverence for His presence and His Spirit. 2 Samuel 6, 1-7 we read, Again David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God, or the ark of the covenant, upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nathan's threshing floor, Yusa put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Yusa, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. You see, the story of David dancing before the ark of the covenant is a clear example of the contradiction embraced today by so many Christians. On one hand, David understood the importance and the significance of the ark. On the other hand, he didn't care to treat the ark as the Lord mandated it be treated. It was not to be carried upon a cart like a common piece of furniture, but was to be reverently carried with great care and caution by priests. Exodus 25, 12 through 14, the law of Moses declares, and thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, that is, on the Ark of the Covenant, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, and thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. In Deuteronomy 31 and verse 9, And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and unto all the elders of Israel. When God gave Moses instruction on how to design and build the ark of the covenant, he said, you're going to have two circular rings on either side at the four corners and there are going to be two wood poles overlaid with gold that will slide through those rings and that is how the ark is to be carried now David was all excited that the ark of the covenant which represented the very power and presence of God was coming back into the city of David. Oh, he was so excited because he knew how important and momentous an occasion this was. And he was so excited at this that he danced and celebrated before the ark as it was brought back toward the city of David. But well, one of the sons of the man who had been playing host to the ark for a period of time in a strange land, one of the sons of the men was 
part of the little entourage carrying the ark on a cart. And at some point, one of the wheels on that cart must have hit a rough spot in the road. And the Bible tells us the ark kind of shifted a little bit. And Uzzah reached out and he was trying to steady the ark. And he touched it. Which God said no man should do because that the ark represented his throne. It literally represented his place of sitting, his, his throne. And Uzzah reached out and he touched the ark. Well, why wouldn't he? After all, they're already treating it like it ain't nothing but another piece of furniture. Got a lot of churches today. You know how they treat the presence of God? You know how they treat the Word of God? You know how they treat the power of God? Like it's just nothing. Like it ain't no more special than anything else. Hello now. They handle it the same way they handle anything else. They, they're careless about it. Like I said, you know, we come to church looking like a pile of bums. We carry coffee into the worship. We carry water and drinks into the sanctuary. Oh, I'm going to tell you, that bothers me. Got people sitting there chewing gum during church. Like a cow chewing its cud. No reverence, no respect. No, I don't need to make any special effort. This is just the house of God. This is just where the power of God is manifest. This is where the presence of the Lord comes down and meets with His people. There ain't nothing special about it. I'll just do here like I do anywhere else. You understand what I'm telling you today, folks? You see, there's a contradiction. On one hand, David's dancing before the ark. On the other hand, all of a sudden he gets upset when, when Yusa is struck dead. Well, David, you need to make up your mind. Either this ark is what it's supposed to be, and you need to handle it the way you're supposed to handle it, or leave it where it was, and none of this would have happened. Oh, we got people who want to come to church, and they want to shout and dance. Oh, they want to celebrate the presence of the Lord. They want to celebrate the power of God, but they want to do it in their flip-flops and shorts. Say, well, does God require that I wear? It's not about requirement. It's about gratitude. It's about appreciation. It's about showing reverence and respect. It's about dressing for the occasion. On the one hand, David understood the importance of the Ark of the Covenant. On the other hand, he didn't care to treat the Ark of the Lord as it was meant to be treated. The church today exists within a culture that teaches God's people that God is cool. He's funky. He's fresh. It is not necessary that we make any special effort to look nice or at least decent and respectable when we go to the house of God. God's fine with us coming in whatever attire we desire to wear. Now listen, folks. If you're on vacation and you don't happen to have any dress clothes or you don't have, you know, decent, nice clothes to wear to church. I'm not saying don't go ahead and come on to church. Like I said, God doesn't ask you to do what you can't do. But if you can, do. Hello now. Amen. He doesn't expect or require any special effort on His part. But this is the very same attitude that nurtures a disrespect for all things holy. If God is not deserving of special effort in relation to our dress, for instance, surely He doesn't really care if we pray. Surely He doesn't really care if we read His Word. Surely He doesn't really care if we go to church or not. After all, he's cool. He understands that we're busy. We have other things to do, like go to the beach, enjoy a picnic, or visit family. But in truth, he does care about all of these things. He has never been okay with his people approaching him as a secondary concern or priority. 
In Deuteronomy 6 and 5, that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. When you love God with all your heart and soul and might, don't tell me that you're not going to put forth special effort. Hello now. And if you can't put forth special effort, if you can't put forth any special effort on the part of, on behalf of your spouse, your spouse is going to wonder whether you love them or not, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I remember one time my booby was away on business. His job sent him up to North Carolina or something like that for a few, couple of days. And he was coming home, and I was so excited. He'd only been gone a couple days, but I was so excited. And I remember, I don't know if he remembers this, but I remember this. And I went, and boy, I dressed up, and I dressed to the nines, and I got looking all nice and everything. And when he got home, I greeted him. I was all showered and shaved and shampooed and quaffed. And I mean, I was dressed to the nines. And I said, I'm going to take you out for a nice dinner. Let's go to the steakhouse and have a nice dinner. You know, I went to a lot of special effort. Because when you really love somebody, that's how you demonstrate that love. How on earth can you, on one hand, claim to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength as the Word of God tells us to love Him? And yet, when it comes to effort on His behalf, in every regard, you take the lazy way out. In every possible situation, you just take it as easy as you can. Because after all, God's going, my spouse doesn't expect me to do all that. My spouse, like, I don't care if Tommy expected me to do that or not. The whole point of my doing it wasn't about meeting a demand. The whole point of my doing it was demonstrating how I felt. Do you get me? I'm telling you, too many Christians demonstrate that they could care less about the mercy of God in their life, that they could care less about God's love, that they could care less about the grace of God, that salvation means precious little to them. That's how they carry themselves. Matthew 6.33, I've said it before, I'll say it again, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, doing right things. And all these things shall be added unto you. Many preachers today would suggest that a child of God who cannot even put forth the effort to show reverence and respect for the house of God, the Spirit of God, and the Word of God is going to be fully prepared to attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. But the whole reason believers do certain things in this life is to dress rehearse, as it were, for the great day of the Lord. Am I telling the truth? No, your attitude, folks, is demonstrated every day in this life. And that's the attitude you're going to carry right up to Judgment Day. And if you've got a careless mindset and a careless attitude, then you better not think all of a sudden you're going to have a whole different way of looking at things when the trumpet blows. The choices we make in terms of not, not just our dress, I'm using dress as an example of priority, but the choices we make speak volumes regarding the activity that we're engaged in. You know, the way you dress going to the house of God says a lot about how you feel about going to the house of God. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? When a man or woman goes to the beach wearing clothing that covers their bodies from neck to ankle, we know that they're either allergic to the sun or they're uncomfortable with their own bodies, right? Right? An individual who wears tight, overly revealing clothing clearly demonstrates that they have little reservation about their body. Am I telling the truth? They have very little reservation about their appearance or their physique. 
A man who goes to work in a suit and tie is likely to have a better, more important and higher paying job than the man who goes to work in jeans and a t-shirt. Am I telling the truth? Our dress says so much about our attitudes and our disposition. When someone is depressed or despondent, they tend to care less about their appearance. A person suffering with depression will often go unbathed for days and will run around in clothing that requires very little effort to put on or to choose. Whereas one who rises in the morning with a positive mindset and a good outlook is more likely to choose garments which are color coordinated and create a generally attractive appearance. Amen. Am I telling the truth? I once had an English teacher. I'm trying to help you understand. I, I know it sounds like I'm preaching about how you dress when you come to church, but that is a metaphor, okay? That's an example. I'm, I'm trying to use that as a, an example of a greater principle here, folks. It's not, not just about how you dress, but it's about how you approach God, how you approach the things of God, period. When I was a teenager in high school, I came to Texas in February of 1982. I was 16 years old, and uh, one day, our English teacher, Miss McCowan, she was a Baptist lady. I liked her. She's a real sweet lady. I really liked her. And one day, she, we all came to class, and she said, you know, class, I've got something I really, really, really need to do this period. She said, how about if I let y'all go to first lunch, which was that period. She said, but y'all have to commit that you'll come back to class during the second lunch, which, which would be the time we normally would go to lunch. You know, so in other words, we're just going to swap out lunch hour, okay? She said, you got to promise me you're going to come back this, for, the, for the second lunch because that's when, uh, you know, we're going to have class the second lunch. And so everybody, of course, said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, yay, we get to go eat lunch early. Woohoo! So everybody leaves room. We all go to lunch. I ate my lunch, I'm looking at my watch, and I said, well, time to go to class. So I go marching on, and I go to Miss McCown's class, and I sit down on the class in my desk, and I'm sitting there, and she's at her desk up front, and I'm the only student, the only one that showed up for class that day. And everybody said, oh, I'm going to be here, I'll be here, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. But I was the only one that actually did it. Miss McCown looks around and she said, Well, she said, I guess they got the last laugh on me, didn't they? She said, Boy, I'll tell you what, she said, not a one of them. She said, Charles, you're the only one that kept your word and came to class for this period. And I looked at her, and you know, I've always been a little bit of a jokester, a little bit of a clown. I looked at her with this serious look on my face and I said to her, I said, do you suppose the rapture's taking place and I'm the only one that missed it? I kid you not, Miss McCowan went hysterical. She started laughing so hard. She, she laid her head on her desk and she was laughing and you could just see her her, her uh, shoulders, you know, bouncing around, and she lifted her head, and she's wiping tears out of her eyes. She was laughing like some kind of a nut. She got such a chuckle out of that. And after a little while, she pulls herself together, and she said, oh, Charles, oh, Charles, what a thing to say. She said, oh, my God, if there was anybody in the world going to make the rapture, it's you. You know why she said that? Not because I'm perfect. Not because I'm sinless. Not because I never do anything wrong. But I'm going to tell you why. Because she recognized a guy who dressed for a wedding. She recognized somebody 
who dressed for the occasion. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? How did I dress for the occasion? I lived like a Christian. I made every effort to do the best I could. Do you understand what I'm saying? Doesn't have anything to do with the clothes I wore, although I was a conservative dresser because I was holiness at the time, you know. Uh, and I still dress the same way I did then, as a matter of fact, so that hadn't really changed. But uh, do you understand what I'm saying, folks? I'm going to tell you something. The world recognizes people who are dressed for the occasion. The world recognizes people who live their lives and conduct themselves in a manner that shows their faith is real, that demonstrates their love for God is real, that demonstrates that uh, they reverence God, they respect God, they appreciate the presence of God, they appreciate the Word of God. I'm going to tell you, I tithe. My whole life I believed in tithing. I grew up, uh, when I was 12 years old, I started a paper route. I think I was about 12 when I started my paper route. And I started a paper route, and one of the first things that I got so excited about when I started my paper route, I was going to be able to tithe. That thrilled my soul to no end. I'm telling you, I was excited about being able to tithe. Every Sunday, I'm going to be able to put my little bit of money in the offering plate and contribute because I love my pastor. I respect my pastor. My pastor's there to help me benefit and be blessed. And my pastor's there to instruct me and to teach me and to help me to know the way of the Lord and to help me make heaven my home and to see Jesus one day. I love my pastors. I respected my pastor. I understood that my tithes and my offerings went to help support my pastor so he didn't have to work a job, but he could do the work of God as he had been called to do the work of God. And as the word of the Lord said, how can they go except someone send them? They have to be sent. They have to be supported. They can't just run off and do something if they don't have any support to do it. And I understood that. And I'm going to tell you something. It was my pleasure. It was my joy to take that first tenth of every dime I made. And I mean to tell you, I didn't try to rob God. I didn't try to skim it. No. Nope. Because you know what? I was so grateful for what God did in my life. I was so grateful for the benefits that I enjoyed as a child of God. Oh, the church was a haven for me. When I went to church, I was surrounded by love and I was surrounded by supportive people. I didn't have all that at home. But when I went to church, there were people who demonstrated love and care and compassion. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I appreciated that. You think, you think I'm not going to dress for the occasion? You think I'm not going to show any appreciation? You think I'm not going to show any gratitude? You think I'm not going to support my pastor? You're out of your stinking mind. But there are people today there are some people, they think I don't know. But I do know. They don't come to church. They live locally. But they don't come to church. Let me tell you, I'm going to tell, I'm going to tattle on you. Because the Holy Ghost has a way of telling me things. The Lord told me recently, He said, you know why those folk right there haven't been coming back to church? You know why? This pandemic thing is kind of closing up. Do you know why they're not coming back to church? Because they don't want to resume tithing. During the pandemic, they took the opportunity to stop tithing because after all, you know, the pastor's needs and the ministry's needs, according to them, apparently all stopped dead in their tracks when the pandemic came. The Lord said, they don't want to, they don't want to keep tithing. They do not want to have to resume tithing. So by not coming to church, they can sit at home and watch videos of the services. They don't have to make any effort at all on my behalf. On my behalf. They don't have to make any effort at all for me, the Lord says. They can just sit at home and watch the service. Because if they come to church, they're going to feel obligated. Oh, bless God, I suppose I'm going to have to tithe. So I'll just say, 
Well, let's just wait until the rapture. Let's just wait until judgment day. And we'll find out from the Lord whether or not you're dressed for the occasion. When I came out in 1989, I'm almost done today. When I came out in 1989, I moved back up north from Texas. I was here in Texas. I moved back to my home state of Connecticut. Got a job at a car dealer selling cars. I was backslid. I, I, I decided I was going to live my reality and I was tired of fighting who I was. I just couldn't do it anymore. I was lonely. I was depressed. I was miserable. I went through a horrific experience here in Texas. The church puked me out of its mouth and beat me up. And I mean to tell you, I just was tired. I said, Lord, forgive I went back up home. I'm telling you, man, I, I just slid into a bad place. I was cussing like a sailor's parrot. I was in a bad frame of mind. I was just miserable. But bless God, I'm going to be who I am. I'm tired of this garbage. Got a job at a car dealership selling cars. First week, I got my paycheck. You know what the first thing I did was? I backslid. <laughs> I wasn't in the right frame of mind. You know what the first thing I did was? I got a money order for 10% of that paycheck and I put it in the mail for a pastor friend of mine down here in East Texas that I loved. And I told him, I said, here's my tithe, brother. I, I'm not in a church up here, but here's my tithe. And I sent that tithe to Brother Allen. You know why, Tommy? Because that's how much it matters to me that the work of God be supported. That's how much I believe in this thing. And if God said He blessed me for tithing, then honey, I'd be an idiot not to believe Him. And I got news for you. I'm going to say this as plain as I can say it today. And if you get offended, good. Because obviously it suits you then. The shoe fits. If you don't believe God, and if you don't believe that God can make 90% of your income do more than 100%, if you will first give the first tenth, the first fruits, in support of His work and in support of His workers, if you don't believe that, then my friend, God help you. There's something wrong with you. How can you believe God for salvation and you can't even believe God to honor His Word when it comes to tithing? And tithing is the only discipline in the entire Word of God where God literally says, put me to the test and try me in this and see if I will not pour out upon you a blessing which you cannot receive. It's the only time in the Word of God that the Lord literally says, put me to the test, try me. On one hand, today's message is not at all about how we dress in this life. But on the other hand, how we approach the Lord in this life is indicative and demonstrative of our attitudes and our convictions as they relate to our God and to His service. The Word of God declares, No man knows the day or the hour when the Master will return. So for me... I believe I put forth the effort in my daily living as to demonstrate to the Lord that I'm dressed for the wedding. Amen. I don't know when He's coming to get me for the wedding, so I might as well do everything I can to be dressed when He gets here. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Everything we do in this life as we live for the Lord and walk in His statutes demonstrates our readiness to attend a wedding. The question then today is simply this. Are we dressed for the occasion? 
Amen. Amen.